The following is a Michigan sesquicentennial year presentation. Michigan Outdoors is made possible in part by a grant from the Stroh Brewery Company, who also bring you Stroh's and Stroh Light, fire brewed for a smoother taste. We're looking at a mounted Michigan wild turkey, and this is a gobbler. It has a little beard here right in the front. This is what it looks like when it's walking through the woods, but this is when it, what it looks like when it's in full strut, displaying like they are this spring, trying to attract the hens and chasing after them. That's when we go after them. As hunters, we're going to show you how we do it. It's an exciting activity, so stay tuned. I'm Fred Trost. It's Thursday night. Time to go turkey calling on Michigan Outdoors. From the rugged shore and woodlands of the north, it's history of copper mines and iron ore, the Great Lakes fisheries. To the farmlands of the southern counties, we'll look around again at all that waits the sportsman in the state of Michigan. And sometimes when the moon brings out the diamonds in the snow and the stillness of the forest lies encased in Arctic cold, the wind might whisper through the trees, listen if you can, it tells you of the beauty in the state of Michigan. Nuego County, 1986. In the spring, neither Bob Garner on the right, sitting by the tree, nor Mick Furbish on the left from Muskegon, a guide, turkey hunting guide, had permits to hunt in this area, but we were trying to call turkeys, show what it's like. Now Mick there, Bob, is using a mouth call. Right, he's using a multiple read uh, mouth, mouth call, a, a double read, I believe. And I'm using a box call over there to the right. It's a much sharper, louder sound. We're going to run this sequence. You're actually here. There's the box call. Actually hear the pace with which you call in a turkey. You get a pretty good idea of it. Now, you're calling quite frequently now because you know there's a turkey over the ridge. We, we heard a turkey earlier when I, uh, when I used the box call, which carries a long way. We heard a turkey over the ridge, and so we set up to try and call it in. And the idea behind turkey calling is to make the sound of a hen turkey, to try to bring the gobbler in because it's mating season. There he is. Oh, there's the beard. Yep. You can see the beard, that little... Uh, like almost like hair, horse hair on the breast of the gobbler. And that's a, that's a two or three year old gobbler. That's a very mature gobbler, uh, probably about 20 pounds. Now when a turkey comes in like this, of course you can't talk back and forth. No. You can't move, you no. can't scratch your nose. Those eyes that that turkey is looking with around the woods, he's looking for the hen. But those eyes are in incredible resolution. Mm -hmm. Well, they're about 10 times better than yours or mine. And they, they can see things moving very, very slowly even. So it's not like a deer where you might be able to move slowly on a bird. You have to make sure that bird can't see if you want to move. Now you're calling. Now it's gotten down to just little perks. Yeah, little, little, little yelps or clucks or whatever you might call them but uh, very infrequent at this point. Ah, he's getting hot. Definitely got his interest. Definitely got his interest right now. And he's looking for that hen all the time. See him displaying like that? He's looking for that hen. Here's, here's the hen, but he can't see her. By displaying, when they fan their tail out and puff out their feathers, they're trying to get the hen to admire all that and come over to him. Right, in nature, that's what happens. See, the, the hen goes to the gobbler. The gobbler doesn't really go to the hen. And so he's right now trying to get her lured out of wherever she is, where he hears her, but can't see her, and get her, get her over to him. <laughs> and that's what he's doing by gobbling, is he's calling, calling the hen over to him. But this gobbler is hot. Oh, he's hot. He's gobbling a lot. He's, he's a little frustrated that that hen is not coming in, but he wants to mate. He's definitely in the mood. And that's why, he's, that's why he's slowing down now. He's not moving great distances at any time because he's waiting to lure her out. Now, you're going to see the camera's going to pull back. OJ is behind you and Mick. Yes. And the camera is going to... Oh. <laughs> He's really getting That's hot. a thrill, too, when you're as close to him as we are. 
You're sitting there motionless. Uh -huh. There you are. Now look, how far away is that, Bob? How far is that turkey it's, with you? It's 20 feet at the outside, probably closer to 15. The problem you'd have if you had a gun on your lap right. is moving that up into position to shoot. You have to be ready before this. Absolutely. And, uh, and, and you have to wait till his head gets behind a tree or, or something like that. Or sometimes he'll even turn around so that tail fan comes up and they can't see behind him. At that point, you can get ready, too. Your faces are covered with masks. Yes, of absolutely. A mesh so the turkey cannot see your eyes because it could see you blink. You could no, see the whites of your eyes. Notice we're not hiding in any blinds here, Fred. No. OK, we're right out in the open. We're just motionless in front of trees or off to the sides of trees. Now, Mick is snugging up next to a tree. See, now, since that gobbler started walking away, he's starting to walk away. You're trying to make a few little noises to call him back. By this time, I've got a sleigh call out, but since it takes two hands to operate, I'm not operating it much. It. But he's at Mick's using the mouth call right now, and he's just trying to keep him interested. Now, Mick is doing something else here to try to bring him back. He's scraping his hand behind the trunk of the tree on the ground to imitate a hen scratching for food or walking. Right. <laughs> Trying to call him back because he wants to go over the edge of the hill. He's, he's frustrated. He is. And if you can see in the extreme right, there's a decoy just sticking out of the right part of the screen there. And the, the cobbler knows it's there. He knows it's there, but he's, he's, he, he's now playing to that decoy. This is the moment. This is what turkey hunters wait for. This is exciting. You can sit for 20 minutes, a half hour. That's it. Turkey hunter calling turkey, turkey calling back. That's the excitement of turkey hunting in Michigan outdoors. Active, hopefully warm weekend, so get outdoors, see if you can catch a big one for the trophy book. Here's the kind of walleye we're talking about from the Titabawassee. Ron Torker from Saginaw caught this nine and a half pounder on a minnow last December when this season was open. Look at what came out of Maxton Bay up in Mackinac County last year at this time. Randy Jensen and Dave Christensen from Trufant caught these 15 inchers on minnows fishing from boats in rough water. Siegfried's Cornets from Grand Rapids caught this 45 inch, 19 and a half pound northern pike last May, trolling a daredevil in Minor Lake, Allegan County at noontime, May 26th. At the end of October, Roger Weathers from Lansing was casting a bomber in Clinton County's Pine Creek, took a 22 inch, six pound, six ounce largemouth bass. You know, last year, some mighty big bucks came from the UP. There's a 12-pointer with 10-inch tines taken during rifle season in Ontonagon County by Jim Furcus from Bergland. A few days before gun season, bow hunter Ron Mast took his second deer of 1986 with a bow. You folks who attend the outdoor fair, I'm sure have seen Ron Mast. He's the president of the Flint Bowman. He's a bow hunter. He spent almost a month out west elk hunting, and what'd you get? Uh, back. <laughs> you got back. That's right. So he goes out west. He comes out on his first day out hunting back here in Michigan. No, that was when I got the five point. I got oh, the five one. point. I got this one later. <laughs> okay, what's the scoop behind it? Uh, just lucky. I went out. Uh, He's sandbagging on us. Uh -huh. Well, I went out in a tree I was going to take you up to, but since you didn't go, I thought I'd go into it. And... Uh, Went out there, I worked all night, got up in the morning early, went out. Details are sketchy about where Ron Mast hunts somewhere in the thumb. He won't tell me, but maybe when you see him at the outdoor fair heading up the archery activities with the Flint Bowman, you can ask where he got that 10 point that made him our Michigan Outdoors Bow Hunter of the Week. But I doubt if he'll tell you. A lot of people have been sent letters, including myself, offering a free Power Sport motorboat. Well, you send the money in, and what do you get? A Power Sport motorboat that you blow up yourself. I mean, it's a jip, a ripoff, something that has continued, persisted. I, I've been frustrated by it. Bob Garner has been checking on it once again. 
You're right, Fred, people are still getting ripped off on plastic boats. It happens this way. A letter is sent to a person in an official looking envelope, offering the person a chance to claim a four-man motorboat, an outboard motor, if they participate in a survey. It's all neatly worded, probably by their attorneys, and it looks like a legit deal. If you call the number to claim your boat, they ask you for your credit card number for payment of almost $200 in handling insurance and postage fees. Now the kicker on the whole deal comes when you receive in the mail a plastic raft with the cheapest electric motor you can imagine. And because the language of the boat offer is so neatly designed, no one in government can seem to stop it. Michigan's Attorney General Frank Kelly has tried, but because Michigan's tough consumer protection laws don't apply to the other states, he's powerless. Kelly's contacted the Attorney General of California, where one of the offers comes from, but apparently he can't stop the bad boat deal either. Now, all of the offers may or may not be legal, but it's the ethics of the companies that really grinds me. Sportsmen, many who saw this ad as a way to finally get a boat for the family, have been taken. Church groups and small businesses that can't afford to throw away a couple of hundred bucks have been taken too. There are two solutions to this problem. One, the Congress needs to pass an act making it mandatory for companies making mail order offers to show the product in a good representative photograph. No one I've heard from would have bought the boat if they'd seen it first. Now this ad in a magazine claims this boat will hold three people in their gear, but at least you can judge it for yourself. The second solution lies with you. If you receive a boat offer or any offer that wants you to participate in a survey, but demands a payment over the phone with a credit card for a product they only describe but don't actually show, throw it away. That's the only way to stop scams like this. And by the way, if you really want a plastic boat, I've seen them in ads in the newspapers for a two-man version for $16.99. All the regulations to keep track of. Bob, we get questions, more questions about regulations than, than anything. Great question, though, from Luann von Christensen of Rochester. She writes and she says, I've been watching Michigan Outdoors for about three years. Although I thought I could never kill anything, I now have a desire to learn to hunt. Where do I begin? I need to learn it all. Rules of hunting, how to use a firearm, and most of all, how to get permits. Also, how much should I expect to pay for a firearm for a beginner? Good question. Round is picked up and then closes. So the recoil action pushes the barrel back with the, the bolt. There being a Our hunter's workshop is the place to come in the fall or the outdoor fair in the summer or take a hunter's safety course. A firearm, well, Bob, one like that, a Browning, it cost you uh, no. Four or five hundred dollars for a new one, but you can get into into good guns for just a hundred or so. You can get a duck call for ten dollars. <laughs> Bob Gerard at the outdoor fair will show you how to use it. Uh, there's not really that many places to go that we know of, no adult ed classes to speak of on hunting, but go to the shows, go to the outdoor fair, attend our workshops, read magazines, watch Michigan Outdoors, and take a hunter safety class. Really, if you're a new hunter, it doesn't matter your age. And most important, get outdoors a lot. Get outdoors a lot. Yeah, we always say it's a great place to be. Now let's see if you folks can answer this question in our outdoor quiz. If you wanted to set the Guinness World Record for the longest continuous fishing trip, how many hours or days would you have to continue fishing? John Reeder from England fished for 504 continuous hours. That's 21 days to set the record. With a truckload of bait, you too can have a shot at the title. You know, in Outdoors Forever, we talk a lot about how so many sportsmen, six out of seven, drop out of hunting and fishing by the time they reach 65. The cold gets colder, the smelt nets get heavier, the physical strain of hunting and fishing takes a big toll. At Tawas this week, I ran into a couple smelt dipping at 2 a.m. in their 70s. I had to find out what keeps them going. Looked like you dipped a few smelt in your lifetime. Well, we picked a few of them out of here, now and then. We ain't got too many tonight, but there's what we got. Oh, yeah, you got about a half a, half a waste basket full there. Yeah. That's because we forgot the pail. Now, what do you do, put Mama over the rail here? Sure. <laughs> Does he have you reach way out there when you have to? No, we just work together. <laughs> she pulls them up. When, the, when there's a lot of them down there, she pulls them up. Ah. And otherwise, I hold the pole here till she gets them ready. This couple was fishing close to shore on the pier in the shallowest water, and I asked him why. My eyes are, I get in cataracts on both eyes and I can't see now in the water down there, see? 
So you stay in the if shallow stuff. Shallow water, I can see them better. Mm -hmm. That's a good technique to compensate for a night vision problem. They also wore snowmobile suits to keep warm so they could stay out longer. Well, we like our smelt. We like to eat them. We like bluegills and perch. I don't go for the big fish. My arms ain't good enough to bring them in mm -hmm. anymore. Well, have mom do it. Her arms ain't much better than mine. Oh, they aren't? <laughs> You'll soon be 73, you know, I'll be 74. Wow. So, damn it, you're, you're kind of weaken up a little mm -hmm. bit. But still enjoying it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we like it. How long have you been fishing together? Well, if we will, you just got married. Uh, be two years, the 29th of September. You guys just got married? Oh, sure. Two years ago. Or it'll be two years, the 29th of September. Well, congratulations. Thank you. How's it been? <laughs> Great. Has it? You bet. I wouldn't <laughs> trade it for it nothing. <laughs> sure. Bill and Evelyn Winnestorf, yeah. newlyweds and enjoying the outdoors together. Oh, well, we've had a ball. Huckleberry and fishing and <laughs> bumming around and <laughs> whatever. How, how long have you known each other? Childhood and sweethearts and found each other again. After our spouse is gone. <laughs> you were childhood sweethearts? No, yeah, we used to run around together, and then we hadn't, I hadn't saw her in 50 years. No kidding. No kidding. Where did you see her after that 50 years? Out on the pier here fishing? No, no, no. She dropped me a letter, and I just started writing her a letter, and that, well, that got it started. A lot of you dying. That's a great story. Yeah, we, we're kicking it off all right. <laughs> That's good. And what's Bill's advice on getting yeah. older? It's a great life you don't weaken. Yeah. So how do you keep from weakening? A lot of people weaken, well, you know. She's a good cook. Go fishing. She's a good cook. If there's dishes in the sink and he says, let's go fishing, the dishes stay in the sink. <laughs> <laughs> Leave the dishes in the sink, go fishing, change what you have to change, but don't weaken, as Bill says. Don't give up. That's how Bill and Evelyn have found they can enjoy the outdoors forever together. Time for a simple recipe, a mild recipe. It's not spicy, not a lot of ingredients. Oh, but it's good. <laughs> Get some game bird out of the freezer. It's excellent. There's Tom Sinizinski uh, from North Muskegon sent this in, and this is a recipe for game bird and sour cream. You could use anything for this. You could use pheasant, quail, grouse. Now, that's chucker partridge. That's that right. Bob and I got last fall when we were doing a story on bird dogs up at the Bourbon Barrel Hunt Club. Okay, now, Tom said to remove the meat from the bones, but these are fairly small, so we're going to go ahead and fry it like this. Face it, we just didn't want to take the time. <laughs> that's true. Laziness. You said it was a simple <laughs> recipe. We made it even simpler. You're going to use just a little bit of seasoned pepper and seasoned salt in your flour, and that's going to make your breading just to make all the juices stick in the little chucker. Yeah, and that's just, uh, that's all the spices there are. That's right. Well, there's a little bit of thyme in here in the sour cream, but that's it. And you are going to fry these, and they fry fairly quickly because they are quite small pieces. And if you cut them off, you just want to hit well, the pan and yeah. then out again. If, if they're boneless, they are that's so right. tender. Yep. And these are good. These are very oh, these tender are, this these way. Are great. This doesn't take very long to brown them. Oh, look at that. Now, those would be good just like that. We'll just mm -hmm. do a little bit of flour and season salt and pepper. But you're going to put sour cream on here and a little bit of thyme. And that's just about it. Roger oh, McCarville said it looks so easy. So I can't believe that they would taste that good. Yes, and the mushrooms. And they do cook down. All well, your mushrooms cook right down. You want to fry those first. And that's in the drippings, in the butter. Yep. And, and you're going to pour all that right on top of your pan. Yep. And the thyme really gives a kind of... You can taste that there's something different there, but not... Overpowering. I, I can't taste it that much. Oh. I, it, it just, it's a very pleasing, yeah. overall you, pleasing. You just uh, know there's Very something. pleasing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just something a little bit different there. And that's all there is to this recipe. You take just that and, and put pour that it all on over the, the top. And it does cook for an hour or, or until fork tender. But you know, so. there isn't a, it's not like sitting in a soup. Or gravy or Even though like you that. do put a little bit of water yeah, in it. You do, and you want to tightly cover this. So it just kind of steams in her light, it won't really, dry out. Yeah, there's more water than there was sour cream on here. <laughs> but here it is, that, that's a beautiful breast right there. And I'll show you how cutting into this white meat right here on this one. I mean, this is, 
much it's tender. It is tender, and I think that water with the covered dish made it uh, moist. Moist, yeah, it won't dry out that way. That's, that's one complaint I have against white meat. Oftentimes yep. it dries out. Freddie, it's it's a shame with this kind of recipe that's finger licking good <laughs> that, that these chuckers are in about 800 pounds a piece. <laughs> that's right. Fantastic. But it is it's so simple. Oh, and it is. The, the taste. You don't taste any spices, do you? No. Mm -hmm. yeah, like I said, but, it, I just, but it's not bland. No, no. There's just it's, something there. You don't a, know what it is. It's an excellent test, uh, texture to it, too. Mm -hmm. It hasn't dried out or whatever. It's just just fantastic. Interesting. Kathy Beitler's done it again. Well, you bet. <laughs> Interesting, easy, way to go, Tom. A great mm, recipe. Great. If you can't get smelt dipping or uh, getting ready for turkey season, at least get outdoors this weekend. The weather should be good. It's a great place to be. See you next week. Any blinds here, Fred? No. Okay, we're right out in the open. We're just motionless in front of trees or off to the sides of trees. Now, Mick is snugging up next to a tree. See, now, since that gobbler started walking away, he's starting to walk away. You're trying to make a few little noises to call him back. By this time, I've got a sleigh call out, but since it takes two hands to operate, I'm not operating as much. It. But he's Mick's using the mouth call right now. And he's just trying to keep him interested. Now, Mick is doing something else here to try to bring him back. He's scraping his hand behind the trunk of the tree on the ground to imitate a hen scratching for food or walking. Right. <laughs> trying to call him back because he wants to go over the edge of the hill. He's, he's frustrated. He is. And if you can see, in extreme right, there's a decoy just sticking out of the right part of the screen there. And the, the cobbler knows it's there. He knows it's there, but he's, he's, he's now playing to that decoy. This is the moment. This is what turkey hunters wait for. This is exciting. <laughs> you can sit for 20 minutes, a half hour. That's it. Turkey hunter calling turkey, turkey calling back. That's the excitement of turkey hunting in Michigan outdoors.